Dorothy Musta, Chapter 41 Sindra was inappropriately excited, considering just yesterday her predecessor's prote- arm had gotten hacked off. Isn't Dorothy generous? she asked as we all lined up in the back of the ballroom, waiting for the party to begin. These new uniforms are just lovely, and so comfortable, too. I smiled and nodded. It was true that the smooth green satin of the dress we'd been instructed to wear for the party felt good against my skin, and I thought comfortable was a little extreme. For one thing, it was too short, and I kept having to stop to yank down a skirt to be sure my underwear wasn't showing. Since I'd last seen it this morning, the ballroom had been lavishly tricked out and transformed to the point where it was unrecognizable. A hundred ruby-red disco balls glittering against this dark, doomed seal- dome ceiling, but unlike the disco balls I knew from back home, these weren't suspended by anything. They floated on their own, pulsing in time to the music, in dipping and hovering and twirling like shiny beating hearts. Meanwhile, the wooden parquet I'd spent so many hours hunched over and scrubbing was magically gone, replaced by a transparent dance floor that looked down onto a brilliant starry night sky, every constellation brighter and closer than they'd ever looked from the ground. Instead of the usual cloth coverings, the tables were veiled in pink hazy mist that looked like it had been torn straight from the clouds during sunset. Sprouting from the middle of each table was a centerpiece that I recognized, the giant, ever-changing flower from the greenhouse. The one that the blossom one with the blossom that transformed right before your eyes from rose to a delilah to an orchid to a lily and on and on in a kaleidoscopic rush that was enough to almost make you dizzy. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Cinder whispered reverently. Glinda did the decorating. She always does such a good job. It's a little tacky, I wanted to say, but the truth was I couldn't help thinking it was beautiful too. Knowing what a coming, that blood would almost certainly be spilled across the stars, made me feel a little sad. Yes, I told Sindra, it's amazing. I could feel the magic coursing all around me and wondered how much of the Dorothy's power was dedicated to running this place. It must have been part of the Order's plan. With all our magic happening here, hopefully no one would notice the witches performing their wards outside the palace. Not until it was too late. The door swung open and the guests began to stream in. The trays were held magically filled themselves with hors d'oeuvres and drinks. The cocktails were garnished with what looked like real emeralds and rubies that floated upon the surface. My heart fluttered. It had begun. No turning back now. The only way I was going to get through the night was by convincing myself that nothing was out of the ordinary. That killing Dorothy was just another thing to check off my list of duties for the day. No big deal. Okay, gals, Cinder announced, facing the rest of us. You've been... You've seen what happens to screw-ups, right? Let's, um, do the opposite. Let's make this ball one day they'll be talking about for years to come. Oh, that won't be a problem, I thought to myself. The maids dispersed, each of us making our way around the room and presenting the party-goers with their choice of food and drink. I served a group of flutter budgets who took forever to decide what to drink, each of them reassuring the next that they were making the right decision, then throwing their selections back like they needed to loosen up more than anything. Next was the stern-looking royal family of Winky Country, all dressed in sparkling pressed tin suits. That would have made the tin woodman envious. They barely looked at me when I passed. As soon as our trays were empty, they filled themselves up again. No one talked to us or paid much attention to us at all. All we had to do was look pretty and not trip. The whole place thumped with music, and all the guests were laughing and chattering. They gathered around Scraps, the patchwork girl, and began to cheer as she pranced and pirouetted in an acrobatic routine that was somewhere between breakdancing, voguing, and gymnastics. When she cartwheeled onto the perfect split, a roar went up from the crowd. Scrap stood and bowed for her audience, and then the music shifted to somewhere slower and moodier. All of the disco balls had been whirling around began drifting toward the highest point in the dome ceiling. There they merged together and began to pulse in time with the music like a huge ruby heart. The heart began to descend slowly. The chatter of the room went silent, and everyone stood still watching it. I scanned the crowd, trying to pick out all the important players. Surprisingly, most of them seemed to be missing. I didn't see the wizard, or Ozma, or Glenda, or Dorothy. The scarecrow, the lion, and the tin woodman were missing, were missing too. For now, at least, it was just the B list. When the glass heart reached the floor, it exploded in a shower of red glitter. Something landed on my arm, and I realized the flash of dots... Flashing dots of red thrown by the disco ball had magically solidified into rose petals. I brushed them off, trying to see through the maze of glitter, confetti, petals, and pink-hued smoke. She really knew how to make an entrance. I'll give her that. 
There in the center of the room where the glass heart had been just a moment ago stood Dorothy. Her entourage appeared too, fanning out behind her. The Scarecrow, the Tin Woodman, the Lion, and Glinda. But they dispersed quickly into the party. Dorothy looked radiant and majestic, every inch a princess. Her lips were glossed, but not with perma smile. Her smile easy and relaxed, and somehow giving off physical warmth if you looked directly at her. Her nails were bedazzled with actual rubies. Her hair was piled up into a spiraling tower of curls, streaks of gold running through it, leading into an ornate emerald hair comb in the pinnacle. The road of yellow brick in the Emerald City, I realized. She wore a long, form-fitting beaded gown that flared out of the bottom and was corseted so severely that I wondered how she could breathe. Her breasts weren't the only thing Dorothy was trying to show off. The fishtail was split up at the side, revealing her most important assets. Her shoes, of course. The crowd went wild at Dorothy's entrance. Their cheers and whoops resounded thunderously through the huge room. Dorothy batted her eyelashes and flicked her wrist like fake humble like, Ah, shucks. One of the servants scurried over to her, and without looking, she grabbed a cocktail, her lips pouting into a dainty sip. A long sip. Finally, the drink half finished, Dorothy blotted the corner of her lips with a napkin and raised her hand to silence her adoring subjects, as if everyone weren't already watching her. Thank you, she said, all, her voice all sugary sweet. I'm so happy you can make it here tonight to help me celebrate this wonderful occasion. A munchkin in a bright orange tuxedo sh suit sta standing in front of me turned to his companion, a squat, monkish man wearing a patterned kimono and a tech tentacle-like braid, and whispered, "'What is the occasion, anyway?' "'She just wanted to have a party,' the other replied. "'I'd assume this was some Oz holiday I didn't know about, but all this work had just been for a whim.' Meanwhile, Dorothy draped a hand across her forehead. "'As many of you know, the last week has been a difficult one for me. One of my closest confidants was revealed to be a wicked, nasty traitor, and as you can imagine, I was quite devastated.' But I'm overjoyed to see, say that that's all been sorted out and things are better than ever. Now, before we get back to our dancing, I'd like to introduce a very special guest who I'm so thrilled to have here. The ballroom grew silent and we heard rustling from the back of the room. A low murmur rippled through the crowd as it parted to make way for the new arrival. Who could be Dorothy? Who could Dorothy be talking about? When I saw her lurching forward in jerky, awkward movements and barely balancing a several trayful of drinks. Her face was bruised and swollen and her green maid's uniform was splattered with blood. Where her eyes should have been, there were instead just two empty blackened sockets. Her mouth was hanging open as if it had been frozen in mid-scream. Unfortunately, there was a bit of a mishap during her interrogation, Dorothy said. But luckily, the scarecrow was clever enough to reanimate her corpse so that she could be here tonight. Deceased or not, I wouldn't want my favorite servant to mess the most fabulous party Oz has ever seen. It was Jillia. The munchkin in front of me dropped his glass. It didn't shatter, but was instead swallowed by a night sky beneath our feet. I assumed around the room other glasses were slipping soundlessly from other shocked hands. I barely managed to steady my serving tray. No one seemed to know what to do as Jillia limped forward. Everyone's face seemed to bear the same look of horrified confusion. Even Syndra had stopped dead in her tracks to stare, tears reflecting in her eyes. "'Well, have a drink,' Dorothy urged us all. "'Go on. It won't disappoint me so much if you didn't.' Her voice was cheery, but there was something in her eyes seeming tauntament to a dare. The giant frog in a three-piece suit looked hesitantly at Jillia, and then back at Dorothy, and finally plucked a glass of pink champagne from the tray. "'Here's to loyalty.' Dorothy said, slowly turning in a circle so she could see everyone in the room. She raised an empty glass as if to toast. Everyone followed suit, raising their glasses, too. To loyalty, they cried out. This time, it didn't sound so enthusiastic, but Dorothy didn't seem to care. Suddenly, the lights went out. For the briefest moment, it was pitch black. A flapping noise came from overhead, like bats soaring from a cave, and then the room lit back up, now bathed in a dim, warm glow. Several winged monkeys swooped slowly above us, each one with a sparkling chandelier harnessed to its midsection by a dangling chang. "'Now let's get this party started,' Dorothy howled. She let out a jubilant whoop, and dance music began to blast. Dorothy began to shimmy and shake, and soon the rest of the room was dancing, too." Jillie continued her march around the room, tottering back and forth, stiff-legged, her empty eye sockets collecting stray pieces of glitter. Everyone she passed reluctantly helped themselves to a drink. It became a secondary sort of dance. 
watching guests anxiously shift around the room to keep clear of Julia's path. I tasted blood. I'd bitten down so hard on the inside of my cheek I kept myself from screaming out loud. I couldn't believe I'd ever hesitated at the idea of killing Dorothy. Watching Julia stagger around the room, a mockery of life. It took everything in me not to rush Dorothy right then. Uh, Astrid, no time long see. The scarecrow stood next to me, his scratchy hand coming to rest lightly on the small of my back. I'd been so distracted giving Dorothy murder eyes, I hadn't noticed him approach. He plucked a flute of champagne from my tray, but didn't drink it. I wondered if it would soak right through him. Aren't these little gatherings just dreadful? He asked me, idly, his butt and eyes tracking a pair of fast-dancing munchkins. A tremendous waste of resources. I didn't think I could look him in the face, knowing what he'd done to Maud and now Jillia, and not give him ev everything away with my uncensored anger and disgust. I looked down at my feet and hoped it came off as demure. I think it's lovely, I replied, replied through gritted teeth. Yes, well you would, he sniffed. I'll be ready to resume our nightly meeting soon, dear. I look forward to them. I suppressed a shudder. I have to go, I said before he could reply. I shouldered my tray and started circulating through the party. I noticed Glinda seated alone at one of the black back tables. She wore a puffy, frilly gown. Her red hair pulled into a tight bun and topped with a tall, cylindrical crown. Cinder approached her with a tray of drinks, and the so-called good witch waved her off, not interested. Glinda never took her eyes off Dorothy, her expression mir mirrored in boredom. Looking like one of those parents with begrudgingly attendance a school play, and then text the entire way through it. Meanwhile, Dorothy danced, hopping and shimmying and twirling. Some of the bolder guests, a fine-featured winky dignitary, a dashing-looking pirate with a wooden leg, attempted to dance with her, but she warded them off with wild glares, never breaking her motion. She was like a tornado, clearing her own space on the dance floor. It was maniac, and in a way I didn't care to think of about sort of sad. But then the line slunk through my field of vision, licking his chops and eyeing me because apparently patrolling the outskirts and creeping people out was his preferred party activity, and I realized I'd been standing still for too long. I wished more than anything that Gert had managed to kill him the night that night in the woods. I made another circuit off the room and ended up where near where the tin woodman leaned. He stretched a tuxedo over his metallic frame, though it bulged at odd angles and didn't quite fit him. He wore a red corsage on the lapel, which had already begun to droop. He looked miserable, staring at Dorothy with a combination of longing and self-pity. He turned something shiny over in his hands nervously, and I inched a little closer to get a better look. It was a tin rose, delicately crafted and shined to perfection. The way the tin woodman's fingers worried at it, clenching and twisting the fragile stem, I figured it would break at any moment. As I watched, he seemed to come to some huge, eternal decision. He nodded and thrust his hands up and down like he was giving a speech to himself, psyching himself up. Then, still clutching his rose, he marched across the dance floor toward Dorothy. Someone plucked a tumbler of whiskey off my drink tray. I moved to keep circulating, but a hand grasped my elbow. It won't be long now. Knox. His hair had changed back to its original color and was slicked back. He was wearing a sharply tailored suit with skinny leg pants. Otherwise, he was entirely himself, like he wasn't afraid to be spotted. This should be good, he said to me. Together, we watched as the Tin Woodman stood before Dorothy, presenting himself with a stiff bow. Dorothy stopped doing the twist to stare at him. He offered her the tin flower, and after a brief moment of consideration, Dorothy took it. Then, after barely looking at it, she placed it on a servant's passing drink tray. Ouch, I said. Next to me, Knox smirked. Dorothy spun away from the Tin Woodman, returning to her feverish dancing. For a second, it looked like he would just slulk away. But then he reached out, attempting to pull Dorothy into an awkward embrace, or maybe initiate a tango. He was also uncoordinated, and it was hard to tell. What he ended up doing was slicing the strap on Dorothy's dress. "'You lummox!' she shrieked, hard enough that the entire party stopped. "'You rusty, empty-headed beast!' This was an opportunity. "'Hold this,' I said, my heart pounding, and shoved my drink tray at Knox. He took it confused, and I pushed my way through the crush of gawking munchkins, gnomes, talking animals, and other assorted Oz weirdos. I knew what I was doing was risky, but another opening as perfect as this one might not come along. I put myself right at Dorothy's side as she berated the Tin Woodman. Cinder was two steps behind me, her eyes narrowing into a glare as I spoke directly to Dorothy. "'Princess,' I said, keeping my voice as servitable as possible. 
Isn't it time for a wardrobe change? Dorothy held up the front of her dress with one hand and another, and other jabbing a ruby-studded finger at the tin woodman, her glare like a death ray leveled on him. Slowly, with an almost physical effort on her part, she turned that gaze to me and forced a smile. Yes, Astrid, Dorothy said. Wonderful idea. So she did know my name. The fact that it came out in the heat of anger made me realize that when she called me random A names in her chamber, she had just been screwing with me. Dorothy reached out and grasped my shoulder effortlessly, casting a travel spell. The swirling lights and thumping music of the party melted away, replaced by a relative serenity of the deserted hallway outside her quarters. Huh, Dorothy said to herself, looking down at her hands. Must have had too much to drink. She tried to teleport us directly into her chambers, I realized, but had failed. The witch's spell was working. They had cut off the Plowless's magic supply just when I needed it. The magic must be leaking out of her. I felt it, too, a strange ebbing sensation. It was like lying in the sun, only to have a huge cloud pass slowly by overhead. Dorothy flung open the door to her rooms and strode inside, already pulling her dress off. Hurry up, she snapped over her shoulder. I won't have buffoonery steal any more of this night. I followed her, pulling my knife out. I felt that same stretching and contorting I'd experienced when I was back in the Order's caves. I was Amy again now. I knew. I hadn't thought about the fact that the magical barriers the witches would cast would break my disguise. It didn't matter. There was no time to worry about that now. And anyway, good. I wanted to be Amy when I did this. I wanted Dorothy to know. She was still a few paces ahead of me, crossing toward her sprawling closet. I closed the distance. Something with sequins, Dorothy said. Fancy, sequin, short, that's what I want. Astrid, find it. The lower cut, the better. That's what you want to be buried in? Dorothy froze, turning slowly to face me. Excuse me? She said, the words out just as she saw me. Amy, not Astrid, eyes widening, noticing my knife. This is for Jillia, I told her, and slashed my knife in a wide arc across her throat.